team. We're starting a new series. We're starting a new series this morning, The Heart of a Champion. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse Samuel chapter 8, verse 10. I believe that we cannot talk about the life of David, because that's what this series is going to focus on, the life of David. We can't talk about David without dealing with the precursor, without dealing with what the people were crying out for, and without talking about his predecessor, King Saul. So that's what we're going to do starting this morning. First Samuel chapter 8, verse, starting with verse 10 as you're getting there. And I just want to actually acknowledge a pastor who's not here with us, one of the pastors that actually was a part of my decision in coming here, someone I worked with at Pacific Union College. I want to acknowledge Pastor Lauren Lim. She is, uh, she's amazing. Yeah, let, let, just let her know that you were missing her. And yeah, we... We are we're so we're so grateful. We still we still have our parents here. But uh, I worked with her at PUC. She was um, uh, my student chaplain, and we, we worked a couple years together. And so I, I spoke with her when this was an option on the table. I said, "Tell me about your church," and she had nothing but good things to say, mostly. <laughs> but she was a part of uh, my decision making, and so uh, so thinking of you, uh, Lauren. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, starting with verse 10, the word of God says, Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people, asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses. He will run in front of his chariots. They will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to, per, uh, to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the invitation to be in your presence this morning as we open our hearts and our minds to you. Father, we're asking for you to just reveal yourself. Tell us what it takes to have a heart of a champion. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen, amen, amen. It was as Samuel was old in age that the elders, the leaders of the people came to him and says, brother, you're getting old. <laughs> and, your, and your sons, yeah, they're not good men. <laughs> and we do not want them to succeed you. So we need a king. And Samuel, the prophet, was so distraught over this. And, and he started to pray to God, I can't believe these people. And God is like, they ain't rejecting you, bro. They're rejecting me as their king. Not you, they're rejecting me as their king up until this point. The only people that had, had led God's children were judges, prophets. If you ever read the book of Judges, it kind of reads like a superhero comic book. It's like the Avengers or Justice League. I call it Judges League. That's kind of corny, but that's what I call it. But a bunch of superhero figures like the Incredible Hulk, I mean Samson, uh, that when he gets angry, the Spirit of God comes over him. He has super strength and, and heroes uh, like Deborah and, and also Gideon. And so, so Samuel is the last of these prophets slash judges. He's the last. The people now want a, a, a new change. They want, they want a, a transfer of power. They want to have a king like all the other nations. Because let's just keep it real. We like to worship people. Can I just be honest with you? We just like to worship people. 
I mean, God is cool and all, but we love worshiping people. We love idolizing people. We, we want to follow them on our social media. We want to dress like them, talk like them, uh, uh, sing like them. We, we, we love hero worship, and the children of Israel were no different. We want a king over us. And Samuel passes along a message that God had given him. He said, if you have a king, I just want you to know he's going to make you all his slaves. Okay, we, we're good. <laughs> But he's going to take your daughters and your sons, and he's going to make them soldiers and bakers and cooks. Okay. Okay, you guys understand this. He's going, to start, he's going to start taxing you and taking money out of your 401ks. Okay. We want a king. But you do understand this king is going to abuse his power. Okay. Even when God tells us how it's going to blow up in our face, we still want it. But that's what sin is, right? Sin is just straight up rebellion. Sin is not, no, not knowing what's right and wrong. We, are, we actually do know what's right and what's wrong. We just want to do wrong anyways. Before, before we go any further, you, you need to understand something. A king was never God's will. Having a king established in Israel was never God's will. That God was willing to allow our will doesn't mean it's acceptable. Want me to say that again? Just because God is willing to allow our will does not mean that it is acceptable to him. There's a lot of things that God allows in the Bible that is not acceptable, but he allows it. And many of us think that because he allows it, that it's cool. Many of us are living in the allowable will of God. Many of us living in the allowable will of God. Many of us doing allowable things, yet expecting acceptable results. Let me say that again. Many of us doing allowable things, but but expecting acceptable results wondering why we're not getting what our heart really desires, wondering why things aren't working out for the better. And just observe what you're doing. A lot of permissible things, allowable things, expecting acceptable results. I know some people try to tell me, oh, pastor, I don't know why I'm dealing with this pain. I don't know why this is happening. And, oh, I probably shouldn't do this on myself. But if I were just to open up your refrigerator, I could probably tell you why. Hello? Oh, pastor, it just runs in my family. No, no, you picked up a lot of bad habits that ran in your family, and now you're complaining, right, about your results. I'm just being honest with you right now. Just because it's acceptable or permissible doesn't mean it's always Beneficial. Come on, somebody knows scripture. First Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 and 24. Paul talked about it earlier in this email, but he says it here as well. He says, I have the right to do what? Anything. That's what, that's what he's, he's quoting people. I have a right to do anything. I can do whatever I want. I'm free. He says, yeah, 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 you say. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is what? Beneficial. I have the right to do anything, people are saying, but not everything is edifying. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others, right? So just because it's permissible, just because it's allowable, does not mean it's beneficial and does not mean that it is edifying. There's a coach back in 1995 who coached the Houston Rockets. His name is Rudy Tomjanovich. He was a player for the Houston Rockets, a pretty decent player, very hard-nosed, blue-bucket kind of guy, blue-collared, you know, lunch bucket. You know, he, 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 he was the muscle of his team, not the most athletic, but nobody was in the 70s. Let's just keep it honest. But he was coaching the Houston Rockets, and uh, uh, I always have to make sure there's a disclaimer here. During Michael Jordan's uh, two-year hiatus, during his retirement, um, the Houston Rockets won two championships. And so going into the 95 season, they were the world champions. But things were a little bit unsettled that season. They didn't do as well in the standings, and they made a trade uh, midseason and brought in one of the stars who was aging named Clyde Drexler. 
This team came into the playoffs as the sixth seed. Listen, if you're not a sports fan, you don't understand this. This example is just not for you. You can just shut down right now. But it's playoff season. Come on, Lakers are there. I know some of y'all thinking about that. And so, 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 so Rudy Tomjanovich was coaching this team that had underachieved uh, based on the former year uh, 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 um, results. And so uh, they go in as the sixth seed, and, and they are just clawing their way through. They face the Charles Barkley-led Phoenix Suns and are down 3-1, and miraculously they come back winning three straight. And some of those games were just like miracles in and of themselves. They end up getting to the finals and beat a younger team that was favored to beat them, led by Shaquille O'Neal and Penny Hardaway. YouTube it, young people, if you don't know. And they win, and, and he's been interviewed after sweeping the Orlando Magic. As he's being interviewed, he, he says this that sounds like it originated with him, but I, I know it, it didn't, and there's other books that have been written that have used this title. But he says, don't ever underestimate the heart of a champion. You guys counted us out. You experts counted us out. You didn't think that we could win, but don't ever underestimate the heart of a champion. And so here we are now beginning this series, and I want to know what it takes to be this person, to have the heart of a champion. David, many know already, according to uh, 1 Samuel and also the book of Acts, know that David was a man after God's own heart. But what does that actually mean, to be a man after God's own heart? In 1 Samuel, in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 16, let's continue Let's continue to read 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 16. It says, about this time tomorrow I will send a man from the land of Benjamin, anoint him ruler over my people Israel. He will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked on my people for their cries have what? Their cries have reached me. Now, we already just learned that having a king in Israel was never God's will. Though he allowed it, it was never God's will will allowable not acceptable but allowable but listen to this text in verse 16 of chapter 9 God says that he has heard their cry and he has answered their prayer he has found a man to rule over them what many of us don't realize is that Saul was an answer to prayer Saul was an answer to prayer God heard his people crying out. He heard their prayers, and Saul, King Saul, was an answer to prayer. But he wasn't the best answer <laughs> or the right one. Can I tell you that the first thing I believe that we need to possess, we want to have hearts of, that, 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 that are a champion, I believe that we need to pray for the right things and ask for the right answer. Many of the things that we ask for, we are not asking with the mind of God. We're not asking, seeking his will. We're not even asking, hoping to edify. Remember, remember what Paul, we just read in, in uh, 1 Corinthians? All things may be what? permissible, maybe allowable, but not all is beneficial or edifying. Some versions say or constructive. When we pray, when we pray with the mind of God, praying the way that God has called us to pray, we are always seeking to build and edify. Some of the prayers that God has answered in the way that you've asked him to answer, you know how those have worked out, right? Can we be honest today? Especially on Sabbath? Some of the people you prayed for, Lord, please, I want a man. I'll take anyone. <laughs> Some of you in your quiet time, in your closet, are praying for a reversal. Lord, why did you listen to me? The right prayers are always edifying. The right prayers are always edifying. Remember, all things might be permissible, allowable, because God, in his, in, in, in his love for our ability to choose, his, his permissive will will give in. 
But not all things are beneficial. Not all things are edifying. If we want to have a heart of a champion, we need to have, we need to not just pray the right way, but we pray for the right answers, and we pray for that which is edifying, that which is building. That means that even in this church, as we think about the future and what we want to accomplish here, we are praying for those things that edify the church body. Not just something for our own personal taste, not just something that just scratches our own itch, but no, we are praying for that which edifies. Let's go on to the next, chapter 9, verse 21. It says, Saul answered, when Samuel finally met him and said, listen, man, God's favor's on you, bro. I'm telling you, God's going to bless you, your family. It's, go- it's going to happen. A championship is coming to this town. First Samuel chapter 9, verse 21, Saul answered, but, I am, not, but I, am I not a Benjamite from the tribe of Benjamin? That's what he means. But am I not a, a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me? Saul is basically saying, let, let me tell you something. The tribe of Benjamin, look at we are we, we never even make the playoffs. We are the worst team of all of Israel, our tribe. It is the least important. I mean, depending on which, which, which book you're reading in the Old Testament, our tribe changes names. We don't know. Is it Manasseh? Is it Benjamin? We don't even know. This is not, this is not the tribe you want to pull a king from. And my clan, my family within the tribe of Benjamin, yeah, the lowest one. This is similar to what Gideon said in the book of Judges, in Judges chapter 6. Why are you calling me, Lord? I'm the least of the least. Why would you say such a thing to me? Can I say something to you right now? Saul was humble. Oh, you didn't like the way that sounded? You wanted Saul to be the bad guy? He's bad, pastor. He's not, he's not King David. Saul was bad from the beginning. No, Saul was humble. This is why God chose him. You, you want some evidence of that? 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 17, real quick. Chapter 15, verse 17. I don't have time to wait. Let's go. Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. He says, were you not small in your own eyes? This was in the future when he was speaking to, uh, to Saul. Look at, look at chapter 10, when he actually calls Saul forward, they cast lots and they call Saul forward, making this an official thing before all of the children of Israel. Verse 21, chapter 10, verse 21, it says, then he brought forward the tribe of Benjamin, clan by clan, and Matri's clan was taken. Finally, Saul, son of Kish, was taken, but when they looked for him, he was what? Not to be found. So they inquired further of the Lord, has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, yes, he has hidden himself among the supplies. <laughs> this, this man was so humble, so lowly in his own eyes, that he, he tried to hide when they were calling his name to be king. He was hiding. Saul was a very humble man, but he was placed in a position where his humility would be obliterated. No matter how humble he was, God knew that being placed in a position that he did not ordain and that he did not want for his people, he knew what it would do. Would they say absolute power does what? Corrupt? Absolutely. Absolutely. God understands our human nature, our fallen nature, and that is why there are certain positions he doesn't want us in, including David. Including David. Saul was a humble man, but he was placed in a position where his humility would be obliterated. It's often not enough to just have the character to face any situation, and I believe that Saul did. I believe that God called Saul because he had the right character. Are, are you hearing me? Saul was the best Israel had to offer. Yes, he came from a family of good standing. Yes, his family had wealth. But even by Saul's own admission, listen, we from the tribe of Benjamin, even our wealth compared to any of the other tribes, it's minuscule. 
He was a man of good character. The Bible does say he stood really tall, a head taller than everyone else. Yeah, he had good height on him. But it was the character of Saul that, that God wanted. He wanted the humility because God was like, I already know what this, this kingship is going to do to his head and heart. So I need, to, I need somebody who's right here, who's humble enough that can handle these responsibilities. So it's not, it's not enough to have the character to face any situation. Watch this. We must have enough character to know when the situation itself shouldn't be faced. I'm going to say that one again because this, this, this one actually probably is tweetable. <laughs> it's often not enough to just have the character to face any situation. We must have enough character to know when the situation itself shouldn't be faced. This is why it's important, and Christ says we should pray this way, that lead us not unto what? Not all of us can handle these situations. Some of y'all can't handle being wealthy. I'm sorry. So you shouldn't pray for wealth because some of y'all couldn't handle it. Some of you cannot handle power. So you probably should not go for that, that, that upgrade. You probably shouldn't be promoted at work. Some of us cannot handle certain situations, no matter how kind and loving you are. I'm telling you, there are certain situations we are not designed for. When God, we'll read, it, we'll read this later on, when God said that David was a man after his own heart, David was a shepherd, not a king. Are you hearing me? David was a shepherd and not a king. And this is going to be the point of this series. We're going to unpack these things because to have a heart of a champion, we have to go deep. So some of us need to pray to, to avoid certain situations. Many of you think you're good. Comparing yourself to other people and go, I would never behave the way that she did in college. Ugh. But some of you, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. This is something that Pastor Mark might say. Some of you didn't have the looks to be in the same trouble. See, these are the kind of things that you don't think about. Some of us don't even have the same set of temptations as others. So when they fall, we want to judge them. Oh, look at them. I can't believe that he would do that. You see, that's the problem with people today. Some of us aren't even faced with temptation. You don't even have temptations to spend your money the wrong way because all you have is enough money to make ends meet. But if you had a million dollars in the bank account, we might learn a lot about you. I'm not trying to be mean or, or dismissive in any way. I'm just simply saying we're not cut out for every situation. I want people's character, really, to stand the test of time. I want to see people's character no matter where they are, if they're on the Mount of Olives or Mount Calvary. I want to see the same character. But not everybody is Jesus. Not everybody's going to have the same character on the Mount of Olives as, as, as they would on Mount Calvary. Not everyone is built like that. So that's why our prayer should be, and lead us not unto temptation. It's not just enough to have the character to face any situation. We must have enough character to know when the situation itself shouldn't be faced. In other words, some of y'all need to stay away from the testing and the temptation. Oh, I'm good now. I've been in the church for a couple of years. I can call her up now. No, 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 no. Some of y'all stay away from the tree. Stay away from the tree. Let's continue on here. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 5, starting with verse 5, says, After that, you will go to Gibeah of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high place with lyres and timbrels and pipes and harps being played before them, and they will be prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. This is, what, this, is, this is what is being spoken to Saul. He's saying this is what's going to happen. Verse 9 says, as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God did what? Changed Saul's heart and all these signs were fulfilled that day. Oh, that's a good word. 
the humble man of Saul, the humble man Saul was prophesied over that he would encounter a group of prophets with musicians. And let me tell you something. Some of these prophets, they got down with music. I'm sorry, fam. <laughs> Later on in David's life, these, some of these prophets were losing their clothes as they were singing and worshiping. I don't want to see that kind of worship up in here. I'm just saying. Some stuff just needs to stay in the Old Testament. But, but Saul got caught up in the spirit and was worshiping, and people started asking, has Saul become a prophet? Ooh, look at that. Look at Saul. Not just a king, but a, but, a, but a prophet as well. And the Bible says that God changed his heart, transformed. See, this is the problem, many of us, because we know how Saul's story ends, at least we think we know. We like to gloss over these situations and say, oh, he was just bad from, he was a bad seed from the beginning. Oh, God just chose a king that Israel wanted, but God knew all along. Stop it. Stop. That's not what the Bible says. Stop it. That's not what Scripture says. God anointed him. God called him. And God's spirit came upon him. And God's spirit changed his heart. Saul, at this moment, is a good man. But I got to say something to you. Change is reversible. Change is is reversible. A lot of times we think that just because God has changed our heart, that that is a permanent change. Saul had a changed heart, but changed hearts aren't permanent. They can be, but not by default. They must remain changed. This is why John 15 is so important when Jesus says, remain in me and I will what? Remain in you. This is why Paul says he dies daily. This is why we're, we're called to crucify the flesh. The decision to be a follower of Jesus is a decision we make every single day. And for some of us, we make it every single hour. Well, there's some out there making it every minute, but I'm just saying it is a continual decision we must make, just like being married. Oh, it sounds good to do it on the wedding day, and I do, honey, I do too. Everybody's singing your praises, you look beautiful, but you have to make a decision the very next day to remain married, right? Even as a parent, we make decisions to continue to parent our children. Just giving birth to children is not enough, and anyone who's had kids, they know this. We must continue to make these decisions because change is reversible. And how do we know this? 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 11 says this. This is God saying to, 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 uh, uh, to Samuel, I regret, I regret that I have made Saul king because he has done what? He has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. What did God say? He regretted, he regretted that he had made Saul king. Wow, that sounds a little bit like Genesis 6 when he was regretted that he made man. Ooh, regret? But why did God want to reverse his decision? Why does the Bible say that? Because Saul did what? Saul did what? He turned away, right? He turned away, and this grieves God's heart. He turned away. It is Saul that made the decision to turn away and not carry out God's instructions. Now, you know, later on in chapter 15, we don't have the time. I wish I could go there, but can I, can I give you just a, a, a theology 101 moment here? <laughs> just really, really quick. It's here, it's here in chapter 15. Samuel goes to, to, to Saul and says, bro, you've been rejected. You've been rejected. And Saul's like, what are you talking about? Well, I did everything God said. No, 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 you didn't. Yeah, I did. I did everything he said. I, well, I mean, there was a little thing that, you know, I, I kept this one king alive, and then we, we took some of their wallets, and yeah, and I mean, but, but, you know, but we all gave it to the Lord. We put it in the tithe envelope, all of it. And Samuel had to keep saying, bro, are you, are, are you playing games with me right now? No, you did not follow God's instructions, and you've been doing this for a minute. 
And I'm telling you right now, you're done. The kingdom is going to be torn apart. You are being removed. Then Saul goes, okay, 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 my bad, my bad, my bad. I'm sorry, I repent, I, I sin. But, but, but the men, they're the ones that really wanted you know, the wallets. I, I, was, I was totally fine with cash apping it. But no, they wanted to take, he just would not accept responsibility. He just, he just could not. And this is, what, this, is what, this is what Samuel says. He says, is God a man that he would change his mind? No, you're done, you are done. It is over, it is finished, forget it. Oh, come on, come on, let me just, just travel with me. We'll go worship together. We can make it all right. I'm, I'm really sorry. No, God is not changing his mind. Now, now, Samuel says this in chapter 15, that God is not a man that he would change his mind. But can I say something? Samuel did not have that accurately because God does change his mind. That's scripture. Nineveh, chapter 3, verse 10 of Jonah, God saw that they had repented, they had changed their ways, and he changed his mind and did not bring about the disaster he had prophesied. That's the Bible. God does change his mind. But pastor, God changes not. Yes, his character never changes. But God's mind is subject to change because we are subject to change. Hello? Moses, you will lead my people into the promised land. Yes, sir. All right. It's been prophesied. Yep, written in stone. We got this. Did Moses lead the children into the promised land? Oh. Now, was Moses forgiven for his sin of anger and arrogance? Was he forgiven? Yes. But did Moses still have to face the consequences of his decision? Absolutely. He had disqualified himself for fulfilling that prophecy of leading the children of Israel into the promised land. Clearly God forgave him because my man's in heaven, right? According to the book of Jude, according to the, the transfiguration in the Gospels, clearly he was forgiven, but he still had to face the consequences of his decision. And so this is what's happening with Saul. Now watch this. Samuel said God would never change his mind. I believe God would have had Saul repented. One of the aspects of a heart of a champion is knowing how to truly repent. No excuses. I messed up. I was selfish. I was greedy. I thought I knew better than you. This is the problem with sin. We, we always have to make excuses. Uh, 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 the woman you gave me. Yeah, she gave me the fruit. I didn't even know what was going on. I didn't even know what it was. I thought it was an apple. And the woman's like, uh. The serpent you made? I didn't make a serpent so crafty, and I for sure didn't put it in a tree next to the tree of life. We make excuses. A heart of a champion knows how to repent, and Saul was unchanged. He might have felt guilty. He might not have liked being caught, but the man remained unchanged. And we could tell because he really wasn't repentant. He did not own his sin and own his failure, because had he done that the same way Nineveh did, God would have changed his mind and said, all right, I'll give you another chance. And how do we know God would do that? Because he did it a lot with David. Hello? A repentant heart is an aspect of having a heart of a champion. Let's close out. The Bible says that God wants someone after his own heart. This is 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, but now your kingdom will not endure. This is what Samuel is saying to Saul. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler over his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Don't really know exactly why it's translated the way that it is, maybe because of how it's translated uh, later on in Acts chapter 13, verse 22, but Kilbebo is the Hebrew word. And it, from that one word, they literally say a person after God's own heart, a man after God's own heart. From just that word, it just means the inner person, the inner being. It could even mean the will. I want someone that is willing, like me, willing to follow me, to follow my instructions. And, and, and not necessarily a man after my own heart, meaning that his heart is like mine, because if we know David, we know that his heart isn't really like God's, but someone willing to follow me. And if you really want to know what God, what Samuel means, because it's Samuel's words in the Old Testament who says God wants a man after his own heart, let's read Acts chapter 13, verse 22. 
Acts 13, verse 22 says, after removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart because he will what? He will do everything I want him to do. What God was looking for is someone to follow. Being a man after God's own heart, a person after God's own heart, being a woman after God's own heart isn't because your heart is exactly like God. It is a heart that is willing. A heart that is willing, a heart that is moldable, a heart that can trust and follow, a heart that knows how to repent, a heart that is humble, can admit and confess when they're doing wrong. And this is what God wanted. I want somebody that can admit when they're wrong. I want somebody who can trust me even when it doesn't line up with their intellect. I want somebody who wants to follow my will, not just seeking for that which is allowable, but wanting that which is acceptable. Somebody say amen. I want someone after my own heart. So 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, and we're going to close out here. It says, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the what? Outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the, at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. At this moment, you almost assume that David must be this guy who's like, you know, some runt. That, that David is unkept and that he's tacky and all this other kind of stuff because God doesn't look at the appearance. But watch this, verse 12. So he sent for him and had him brought in and he was glowing with what? Glowing with health. I know it's not on the screen right now. But you have to look in, you have to grab your Bibles and look at it. 1 Samuel 16, verse 12. 1 Samuel 16, verse 12 says, So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. My man was fine. Glowing with health. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully, powerfully upon David. I want you to know this, 1 Samuel 16, 18. 1 Samuel 16, 18. A servant to Saul says, I have seen son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is fine looking. And the Lord is what? With him. Why do we always assume that David was just this little old scraggly boy? David also was a good looking man and powerful and a brave warrior. This misnomer that God was trying to do the opposite of, of Saul. The problem with Saul wasn't his looks. We're not even told he was that good looking. The, the, the problem wasn't his looks. The problem wasn't Saul's height. What God was looking for was the heart. He doesn't care if the person is rich, tall, good looking, an athlete, former NFL player. He's looking for the heart. David was just as charming, just as good looking, just as brave. And the man had some muscles too. And God was like, that's pretty. I want the heart. I just need a person who is willing to follow me. One of the things that we have to be careful that we don't struggle with in this church family is this judgment. Pegging people. Oh, I know. Yeah, I see you. You think you, you think you all hot coming in here looking the way you, I already know what kind of person you are. Oh, you've got money, you fly. Okay, I already know what kind of person you are. I, this is what we do, right? Saul's the enemy. David's the good person. They both were bad kings. Can I just say that right now? <laughs> Spoiler alert, they both were bad kings. God didn't reject Saul because of his looks. Saul was no longer teachable. He didn't want to follow. And at this point, God's hands are tied. He knows that Saul's going to do more damage. Saul ruled for 42 years. He wasn't that bad. Hello? He ruled for 42 years, longer than some of the judges in the book of Judges. He wasn't that bad. Stop judging people just because their ending was a little murky and a little muddy. Stop it. Saul, God, loved 
And there was nothing about Saul's condition that God was like, oh, I can't, I can't, there's no way I can ever forgive him. Because remember, Moses was disqualified from leading the people into the promised land, but Moses was still forgiven. Amen? Don't be surprised if one day you see Saul in the kingdom. Because God could just say, yeah, yeah, I had, I, he had to step down. <laughs> but Saul was also forgiven at Calvary. Amen? Amen? We all come to this. We all come to this church with different stories, different backstories, with, with, with different statuses. We, we don't know everything about one another. But one thing we have to do, we need to see the best in one another. We need to operate in better faith with one another. More humility. More openness to God's acceptable will. Not just what's allowable. Lord, what do you want me to do? And remember, remember what, 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 what Paul says. He says, not everything, not everything, I mean, all things are permissible, but not everything beneficial, not everything edifying. Listen, there's a lot of things that have gotten by in this church, in this community, that have been allowable. But what we want is what is acceptable. A lot of things that we've gotten by with that is simply permissible, but we want God's best we want what's edifying. And when we have that attitude, David and Saul work together. Amen? Oh, I got something better for you. Judas and Peter work together. Mary and Martha work together. No more judgment. 1 Corinthians 12. 12 through 14, 21 through 27 says, just as the body... Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, rich or poor, black or white. And we were all given the one spirit to drink, even so, boomer or Gen X or millennial. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Verse 21 says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are what? Indispensable. And the parts we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable, what do we do? They're treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body. All oh, the parts like Saul. The parts like Saul. The parts like Saul. They receive special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no what? Division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers... Every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ. Each one of you is a part of it. Edify one another. There's someone here today. You have some old wounds in this church. For some of you, it goes back generations. You felt misunderstood. You felt judged. You have screenshots of text messages that were sent to you. You have emails that still burn you. And you can't believe that you could worship in a church where some people think like that. Those people, those Sauls, those Davids. Pastor, they're the Pharisees. No, Pastor, they're the tax collectors. Stop it. We are all one body, and God is wanting to anoint you. He's willing to trust your heart. We've been doing this for a long time. This will be my first time doing it. But there's a specific reason why we're going to do it right now. We have a special prayer and anointing. I'm going to ask the singers to come up. We're going to sing a song, and I just want you to think about what God is calling you to right now. What God is calling you to right now. You're Saul, you're David, you have this quality, you have that quality. I don't... 
at this moment, it's between you and the Lord right now. All I know is that the Holy Spirit has been working on you, and you no longer want to deal with just the permissible. You're not just trying to go for the allowable. You want what is acceptable. You want what God wants at this point. Your heart is repentant. There are, there are relationships that need to be mended, bridges that need to be built. But if we're going to do what God is calling us to do in this church and in this city, we have to do it together. All of us, with all of our special, special interests, we're going to have to do it together. But pastor, they always get special treatment. Okay. Paul didn't seem to mind that. If that's what they need, if they need preferential treatment, are you okay giving that to them? But pastor, I feel like they always get their way. It's okay. Let God's will be done. Are you willing for that? Father, thank you so much for what you did here this morning, going into the afternoon. So many hearts that need to be healed and restored and made right, not just with you, but with one another. Father, we want what is edifying just moving forward. That's all we want. What that which is edifying. We want hearts that are after your own which simply means a willing heart. A willing heart that won't give up, that will follow no matter how difficult it is. So thank you for the challenge you've given us today. Some of us are Saul. Some of us are David. Some of us are Benedad. It doesn't really matter. We all have a story. No judgment. We're here and we're willing to serve. Thank you for those hearts that have been reconsecrated to you and those who who didn't come up forward but still made the same decision it's all good you hear you are watching and you know we just want to have hearts that are chasing after yours in jesus name amen god bless you church family